Hello, everybody. It's me, and I'm back. <laughs> I think this is going to air on Easter Sunday. I'm not really sure when it's going to air, but if it airs on Easter Sunday, thank you so much for being here with me. I really do appreciate it, and happy Easter, and springtime blessings to everybody who's here. Thank you for inviting me into your life and also into your homes. As to the video today, I decided to do... Uh, good, better, and best. I had promised this for a long time, and I now have the time to sink into this as a very specific video. Now, you might ask yourself, why is it important? Well, this one's going to be on amethyst and also the way amethyst was used specifically in gold brooches between 1900 and 1915, 1918. So I try to, to hone it down into that as a specific. I was going to do a comparison. Like I was going to show a turn of the century brooch in gold and a Mexican set in sterling silver that used amethyst. But I wanted to give a more specific good, better, and best. Eventually, I'll kind of compete the materials against each other in future videos. Like a Bakelite video on good, better, and best of Bakelite, and not specifically just brooches. Or maybe I would do like brooches and against each other, and then maybe a brooch versus a bracelet versus a necklace of like a good, better, and best in an escalation of values. Now, why I want you to watch this and not fast forward, I want to get right into this today, because I don't want anyone to miss this really important information. I was asked on books that I use, and why I used certain books. Well, this one is one of the first. It's by Stephen Giles, G-I-L-E-S. And Stephen produced a really strong, fantastic, kind of a pocket guide. This book has been with me for a long time. I think it was from 1997. I think that's the um, date on this one. So there's the title, Jewelry Antiques Checklist. And it's by Millers, who produces some of the most amazing books on price guides, basic information. Judith Miller has produced some of the most amazing books on general line antiques. Her values are accurate. Her photographs are wonderful. The layouts of all of the Miller's books are very user friendly. Again, I don't get anything for that as like a paper motion, but it's just in my opinion of the books that I have used to obtain my information that has really stuck with me and has helped me escalate uh, very, very quickly in this business and has kept me very solvent in knowing prices, current values, and what to look for. So there's that book. And I'm sorry that there's a little bit of a glare today on everything, but the ring light was fighting with me and, you know, it is what it is. But there's the, there's the Antiques Checklist book. And on the inside of the book, it gives basic information in the beginning of certain time periods. And again, it touches on certain gemstones that were specifically used in antique jewelry. So you won't see things like blue topaz, you won't see certain stones really uh, featured here, but in the topaz, you'll see the fancy colors of topaz. You won't see blue topaz because it wasn't used in antique jewelry. Um, it talks about the cuts. Whoa, it's really flashing that out. Oh, there we go. Now the camera's starting to, and the light's starting to get along with each other. But it talks about the cuts of stones. I could talk about this book in a whole nother video, but then it goes into cameos, intaglios, and then it talks about the different movements. Modern, Victorian, turn of the century. Then it breaks it down into the subcategories of what the ornamentation was. Earrings, rings, necklaces, what to look for specifically in certain time periods. What I love the most is the breakdown of, um, let's see here. <laughs> it's, it's still fighting with me. There we go. Uh, it's, it's definitely because it's low lighting outside today. But again, if I air this on Easter, happy Easter and springtime blessings to everyone here. And thank you so much. The weather has started to change here drastically. Why I bookmarked this one and I wanted to focus on this right here. So Art Deco necklaces. Why I like this as a checklist, and I'll move on to the next one very quickly, but Art Deco necklaces, it asks four very specific questions. It says, in identification che checklist for Art Deco necklaces, is the design abstract, geometric, or oriental in inspiration? First question. Second question, does the necklace incorporate semi-precious or unusual materials? That's the second question. Are the stones cut in unusual shapes or carved? Third question. And the fourth question on the checklist is, are the forms and colors bold and dramatic? So 
You might ask yourself, the first question, does that apply to specifically Art Deco? Well, it may be that you have something that's an antique rather than Art Deco. If you don't have all these checked on this list, you might have an Art Deco inspired piece from a later time. So you might have an Art Deco piece inspired from, you know, made in the 1970s or 80s, looking back at the Deco time period. So just kind of be mindful that when these questions are asked, you should have a check in every column to then assist you to do further information on your own after you have this checklist in place. But it's very, very helpful, very good book, very good guide, and it's an easy read. So then it breaks down Art Deco bracelets. Uh, it helps kind of curtail some of the common mistakes that are made by people who um, uh, don't have the right information or have pulled it from a source online that may not be accurate. And then it's kind of uh, misinformation at that point. So please consult that book. It's fantastic. The next book is Antique Jewelry. And this one's been with me since 1992, I think. I think this is 1992. I could look. But um, it's by Arthur Guy Kaplan. And it's the sixth edition. I don't want to talk about next editions or editions before this, but this is the one that I chose to use. And look how long it's been with me. It is the dirtiest book ever made. And look at the wear on the cover. I mean, this has been with me for so long. And I am the dirtiest human that God ever created. <laughs> but it's made me a lot of money. So this has stayed with me for a long time. It's the official guide to antique jewelry identification and price guide. Now, a price guide from 1992 doesn't apply to today. So just use it for its baseline information of the different design aesthetics on bracelets, Victorian, Edwardian, Art Deco line bracelets. Again, try and it's it's good to see what the values used to be. You know, the used to be values again today, um, you know, a third have kind of stayed where they were, a third are definitely down, and a third are above. That's just kind of the breakdown that I've seen through what I do every day for work. So just remember to do current Inform current research on and information on current pricing and what the rates are sold through. All right. And uh, it talks about brooches and cameos. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the book is in black and white. And that's very frustrating to me as a person who learns from visual information. Uh, it's it. It's problematic because there's a very small section that's in color. And I mean a very small section that's in color. And uh, I get a little frustrated because when books are like this and they don't have the information of value and they just have them numbered, then you have to flick back to like where the values are or the information is on how they're constructed. A little frustrating to me. So I didn't like that part of this book. But when it gets into earrings, let me go back to that. Whoops. When it goes, <laughs> look at me go. When it gets into the earrings, it shows the design of Victorian earrings of what to look for and even the ear wires. So it gives great visual information and a ton of it. Um, I've seen other books that give a lot of information, but they're timing or, or I should say dating sometimes isn't accurate. Portrait miniatures. You might ask yourself, all of this really isn't what I want to learn or what I want to know about personally, but you actually do. You actually do want to learn about this because you'll become extremely smart um, when you're out at the thrift and you're seeing some of these forms and some of these styles, then it gets into stick pins. I could go on about this forever. So please consider getting this book or an edition of this book. Um, it has made me uh, extremely um, wealthy in knowledge and also financially, it has really helped me um, hone in and grow my business in such a positive way. And I have hundreds of books in my library. Let me stress that. I was doing research back before there really was an internet. <laughs> so uh, this one is further proof that I've been doing this for a very long time. And no matter how long you've been doing it, you're still learning. Uh, this is old jewelry, and it's specifically dated between 1840 and 1950. So 1840 to 1950, old jewelry. There's the book. Look, <laughs> look at the wear of this. This one's been with me since the um, early 1990s. It's by Janine Bell. And Janine, super smart and, and um, 
a brilliant mind and specifically on Victorian, Edwardian, Georgian, very, very old items. And this book really focuses on that. Again, look how dirty the book is. <laughs> uh, those are lockets and curb link chains, Victorian, um, just a phenomenal library. And again, can you trust these um, price prices in here? No, you cannot. But can you trust the fact of the difference between Jet and Gutta Percha and the difference between Gutta Percha and Vulcanite? You most certainly can trust this book to help you navigate those materials, how to test for them, what to look for in construction. It also talks about how jewelry was hand in hand with fashion. Um, and it's a wealth of knowledge. So we're 10 minutes in. I don't want to drone on too much longer about these books, but these are, as I lose another paperweight of one of my most favorite pages for some reason, <laughs> probably because I found the piece that's in the book. But I'll tell you what, for a wealth of knowledge, and it gets very close up on these things. Why I don't like lecturing you and, oh, that one actually right there, that this horse brooch on this side right there, that horse brooch, you'll remember in a past video of my cameos, I have a, a deer brooch uh, Essex crystal car from behind rock crystal that's set in gold. It's the same way. So when I saw things like this, I committed that to memory. So when I was out shopping or when I was out looking um, and letting these things find me, guess what? I then knew, oh, that was in one of my books. And, you know, in my database of information, whether it be photographic memory or not, um, I raced home and I would know what book to run for and, and what book I saw it in. And again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on my shelves. But again, it breaks down the time periods, 1940s to the 1950s, what to look for, how to be smart, how to be savvy. We're 12 minutes in and I promised never a lecture series, but I needed you to know about those three books specifically. And look how I start off slow and easy and calm, and then I get completely crazy because when I talk about these things, I get very excited to share with you some of the things that have helped me navigate my business and become the person that I am both in my collection and my ability to resell and make money. Now, the reason why you're here is the good, better, and best of amethyst brooches, specifically amethyst, specifically gold, and specifically a time period of 1900, 1905, to about 1918, all right? So I don't want to ruin the surprise. There's this one, there's this one, and there's this one. And of course, you can probably already tell um, which is good, better, and best. <laughs> it's not just based on size, but it's going to be based on craft and quality of stones. I'll take it over to the light box like I always do. I don't want to be far away. I want to show you the specifics of construction and what to look for in the gemstone as well. And the reason for this is, um, as I, I have terrible allergies today, so please forgive me. Um, amethyst is the most beautiful purple gemstone. There's so many purple gemstones, but amethyst this really is known for being an exceptional purple. Um, purple, it represents renewal, it represents rebirth, and it represents resurrection. And uh, it is the time of year that um, we celebrate that and that we're all entitled to those three things. Um, Amethyst is also known to be a creative stone. It's very royal. It has to deal with femininity, and it also has to deal with rich spirituality. So it's been a favorite gemstone of mine for a long time, and I just want you to remember, purple to me just says spring. And here we are, and thank you so much. Just wait one second. You know, I love you very much. You know how I do this. Wait one sec. I'll be right back with you. All right, wait one sec. Well, you made it back to the light box with me, and here is the first of the good, better, and best when it comes to amethyst. But first, look at this awesome turn-of-the-century velvet box. Uh, again, when I receive these um, and I buy these, I usually try and get them in their original boxes. Uh, and this is as close to an original box as you're going to see. So this first amethyst brooch, as you look at the good version, this is the good version. There is such a beautiful um, oval, very deep, saturated, moderate hue, purple amethyst, uh, surrounded by seed pearls. Let me see if I can sneak this out of here, because I wanted to talk to you about the construction of these brooches. Um, I should have had this, oops, I, I think I just, here, 
Uh, let's see. Almost a mishap. <laughs> okay, now I got it. All right, so this one, based on construction. So I want you to see, as I try and put the class back in there. There we go. Now I got it back in. Okay, so let me check out the marking on the side of this really quick. And thank you again so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I really, really do. Let's see. Uh, yes, okay, so I wanted to make sure it was 14 karat gold. I think all three are in 14 karat gold. Look at that. So it's turn of the century. Um, it is surrounded by prong set half drilled seed pearls. But look at the construction. There's the 14 karat gold mark right there. Right there is the 14 karat gold mark. And again, beautiful uh, lever clasp that snaps down. And look at the construction. Look how deep the stone goes. So you know that this is the quality that we're looking for to be good. This is almost above good. This is almost better. But uh, we start with good on this one. Great color saturation in the amethyst. The stone on this one, let me grab my notes. Uh, the stone on this one is approximately between 18.5 um, and about 22 carats. And that weight estimation based on the measurements. So you can use a micrometer measure across the stone this way, across the stone this way, and also the depth of the stone when you can. And you can get a micrometer on that because you can go around the mounting. Sometimes you'll have to guess the, the depth of the stone, and we'll get into weight estimation in a different video. But look at, there's almost a bluish cast to that amethyst. That is a beautiful stone, beautifully cut, great transparency, not a lot of color zoning, meaning when you flip it over, you don't see a tremendous amount of color zoning in that stone. You might see a little bit here or there, but you don't see a tremendous amount. We'll get into what you look for in terms of color zoning in another video, but that is just incredible for a good version of an amethyst brooch. That one value-wise, if you were to find that today, that would probably be around... I would say between $495 and around $600. Um, could you get it for less? Absolutely. Would you be paying a little bit more in some places? Yes, but look at that refined mounting as well. But the construction of the gold and the way that's all soldered together, that whole crown-like construction on the side, and then they used the prongs in between where those peaks are to set the amethyst. But a beautiful, beautiful turn of the century and we would consider that um, in the Edwardian time period. So most jewelry historians would say that that is, in fact, Edwardian. And uh, just in a, a beautiful and sweet version. Size-wise on that, I believe that it's about an inch across. So from here to here, that would be approximately an inch, just so you know, scale-wise. So there's that. Uh, and I'm not one to compare things to a quarter. Uh, I just, <laughs> or like if I have a vase, I cannot put a Coke can with it. It drives me crazy. Now, on to the good, or uh, the better version. So this one, let me back out, because now we're awfully close. And let me back out. So this is another uh, pearl push-button box. Turn of the century, probably around 19... Oh, around 1900, maybe around 19, this one, maybe around 1912, the box. Now, the brooch inside, here's the better version. You can notice that the stone is slightly darker in its color and its saturation. It still has that push and pull of a secondary pink and blue flash, which is what you really look for in amethyst. Note the way the stone is faceted. The table, which is on the top of the stone, let me grab my pointer. It's here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. Um, this one's not my favorite, but we'll go with it anyway. Um, so notice the top table of the stone, this facet right here, and those books that I had just mentioned cover some of this information. Look how small the table of the stone is. So you have a lot of additional facets on this crown angle right here. So the crown that goes from the table down to the edge, look at, look at that. Look at this. Look at how many facets there are. And that really pushes the um, the light right back out to the viewer. It doesn't absorb into the stone like some do. 
onto the mounting. The stone is beautiful. Look at the bezel, how well constructed and how well crafted the bezel is. Very tight, very thick metal. Notice the thickness of that bezel. That's another telltale sign that this is gold and extremely well crafted. Now you have a secondary lip here that also has some slight decoration and then a almost floral blossom and leaf design holding these wired pearls. So those pearls, let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to uh, back down because uh, there we go. There. I like to try and stay as still as I can for you. Rest my hand down instead of <laughs> trying to balance on one leg like, like most times. Um, so see how the seed pearls are on a wire and then they're wired on and then that wire is passed underneath these stations that hold those natural tiny seed pearls onto the wire as a border for this incredible amethyst brooch absolutely incredible. The size stone on this one, weight estimation, and this was a tough one, uh, weight estimation was between 52 and 60 uh, carats, or 60 and a half. That's the close closest weight estimation that I could personally get on this one. The stone goes incredibly, incredibly deep, almost touches the pin back on the back, and, and you can note color zoning in this stone. See, when you when you look for a natural amethyst or you look for a natural gemstone, I could do a whole course on this, and I probably will. But see how this is lighter, and then you kind of see these veils of color? Look for that in your gemstones, because that is really going to help you pick a natural gemstone in most circumstances. I'm only going to talk on amethyst with this with this video. Look at how light this gets on the outside and then how dark and saturated this gets. As you turn this, that should stay. That shouldn't vanish. And look, it does stay. It stays 360 degrees. But you can kind of see these color veils like where the natural stone grows. That's a natural amethyst. So be very um, cautious when you're looking at stones. Flip them over and see how they perform on a white piece of paper. Let me... Uh, uh, turn the uh, camera light up as well. Let me pause it right there. But you can really see how dramatic that is. So much, much lighter and then much, much darker on this side. So there you go. That'll help you identify a genuine amethyst as opposed to any sort of synthetic or synthetic spinel, synthetic uh, in, in, in a purple stone, I should say. So there you go on a natural. Signed right here, 14 karat. Again, on that turn of the century lever clasp. Right there. So that's, uh, again, uh, are we going to fight over the date of that? I'm, I'm not going to, but I'm going to say between 1900 and 1918 on that. Uh, and again, I had mentioned in uh, previous videos that uh, sometimes those were um, borrowed uh, at a later time period. But the rest of the construction says I'm 19, 1905 to 1915 on this specific brooch. So look at the color saturation of that amethyst and incredible coloration. Now, on value on this one, um, because it's in the better category and the size stone and the color of the stone and the craft of that incredible 14 karat gold mounting, I would say between 700, you know, 700, 750 on a retail level. These are always retail prices um, to maybe about $800 or $850. Uh, but it's incredible. And can you see it for more? Absolutely. Uh, would I feel comfortable saying it's worth more? Not at this particular time in the history of collecting, um, but it's it's really beautiful and it's a fantastic version. So there's your better version. Now on to the best. And I go crazy when I see this one. It's just natural. Let me back out because this, this box is so big. Now, um, are you looking at just only size of stones? Like good, better, and best, meaning like big, bigger, and biggest. No, not not at all. Um, that's not what we're only doing here. We're looking at it all-inclusive. We're looking at color of stone, the cut of the stone, the quality of the stone, and then the quality of the metalwork, um, and then the size, <laughs> you know? So don't just base good, better, and best on size. Um, and again, in for future videos, I want to compete this with like the better or best version of Mexican sterling silver and amethyst jewelry or um, an amethyst ring, you know? So uh, I want to compete those things eventually. Again, a pearl push button box and wait till you see this. 
This one gets me going. Yep, I can't believe it either. <laughs> Most of you are saying, I just don't believe what I'm seeing. And there's going to be, oops, there's going to be a lot of gemstone people that come into these videos that will be pleasantly surprised by the application of some of the gemstones that were used in the history that spanned before us. A lot of people that are certified gemologists aren't familiar with the history of gems and the history of the way that they were used in jewelry. And I get that a lot at the talks that I give. I get a lot of gemological people who are astounded at some of the things, not only in my collection, but in the history of jewelry. This is gigantic. This brooch is massive. So the amethyst that you're looking at, not only one of the finest in terms of color saturation and cut and clarity, but you're also talking about this, this lush velvet color in a stone this big. Now let me show you something in comparison. So this stone is in comparison an amethyst as well. It's very, very pale. It's beautifully faceted. It is a, a very, let's say, comparable size. This one weight exactly is 157.2. Two carats. This one weight estimation was approximately 150 to 155 carats was the closest that we could weight estimate this stone. So very, very um, comparable in terms of size and carat weight, but look at how light this stone is in comparison to this stone. So yes, you can find very large amethyst. This, there's nothing taking away from this. This is a beautiful gem, and I was very happy to buy this. I really loved this in its size and its proportion and the way that it was faceted. And I loved the pale color. I loved that. What says springtime more than violets and, um, you know, purple flowers, crocuses? What says more than, than this for springtime jewelry? Look at how dark and saturated that amethyst is. It has a very reddish blue overtone and undertone in its stone. It may look incredibly, incredibly dark in this because it's pinned down in this box. I will remove it, but look at the gold mounting. So not only size-wise is it more important, but look at that outside layer that they so carefully hand engraved. There is the close-up. Look at the attention to detail. Again, let's look very, very close. So let's examine this that I never really noticed before. There's a rope twist border that was soldered down to this bezel. And again, look at the thickness of the metal on the bezel. So take your loop to the store and look very closely at construction of these things. This is the best version that I have found in 26 years. There is another layer of gold here. Look at the application of these very heavy medallions that are floral, again, natural seed pearls that are slightly larger than the past one that was the better brooch. And look at this hand engraving. I want you to also notice, look at the slight oxidation on the gold surface. Gold does oxidize and gold does tarnish. Not as much as silver, but please, when you look at that, someone may have thought this was brass. Someone may have put this in the costume pile because the stone is so large and the stone is so saturated. So they may have put that into the costume section. So please be careful. Take your look, your, your very close look, and please bring your loop when you're examining these things. This one just makes me so excited. And let me unpin it from this box. And thank you again so much for sticking with me. I really do appreciate it. Um, I should have had all of these undone, but I, I didn't think of it, so I'm sorry about that. Here, I'm going to sneak it out for a minute. And again, thank you oh so much for, um, for everything, for everything that you do for me. And again, I always say it, but I want you to know how much I love you. And I also want you to know that I hope I return all the love that you give to me. I really hope I do that for all of you. Let me clean up the back of this. It's slightly, uh, slightly dusty just because it's been in that case for a long time. Now, Look at the back. Look at the way this is constructed. Um, incredible construction. The stone goes incredibly deep in the mounting. And again, there is a slight oxidation to the gold. It is solid 14 karat gold marked here. And I also tested it. And look at the oxidation here. Gold does oxidize. You have to remember that. Please remember that. So this is a fold down bale. This definitely folds up. 
This folds up this way. I, and uh, it does swivel, so you can wear it as a pendant. Uh, let me put that back down carefully. There we go. Now, this has been replaced. So this fold over or roll over is newer than the rest of the brooch. So the original lever back probably gave up and a jeweler so carefully soldered that back into place. That would have been a challenge. They probably would have had to heat sink the pearls or they would have had to remove the pearls and put them back on. But that, or if it was well um, um, laser welded, they may not have had to remove all that. But look, that clasp has definitely been replaced. That is more contemporary than this brooch. And this one, again, you're probably going to say it's dated to right around 1900 to 1915. Let me move the box out. I want you to study this stone. I want you to take that in. The goodness that that provides, the color of resurrection, the color of royalty, the color of spirituality, and femininity. Purple has been one of my favorites um, to decorate with and also in amethyst gemstones, in art pottery and art glass. So what a beautiful color. And again, the color saturation on the stone. You can look at it. We'll zoom in from behind. I want you to take in all of this information. I'll pick up a little bit so light will go through. Look, there's very minimal color zoning. It's there. It's present. So you can tell that that is a natural amethyst out of the ground. And look at the facets on this very evenly spaced, very beautifully done. We'll flip her around. Look at that. You could stare at that for, for days and, and never get tired um, and, and realize how beautiful things are that Mother Nature has created for us to wear as adornment. This is just an incredible, incredible amethyst brooch. Value on this. I feel a little bit challenged um, to come up with a current value. Can you find an amethyst this large? Yes. Would it run between 2,900 and 3,200? Probably, more than likely. In terms of, again, color, cut, um, carat weight, and the color, you could definitely attempt to replace it. The mounting and the seed pearls and the age of it, it's an additive process on this. Uh, conservatively, between five and 6,000. Probably, you could probably get it for five, and you may have to pay sixty five hundred. So um, the range and uh, it, it's always subjective. Price is always subjective, but between five thousand and sixty five hundred dollars. So I will leave it at that. I'm going to get this back into its case, and I'm going to get these things back to safety deposit as soon as humanly possible. But that's um, that's the amethyst, good, better, and best. Again, there's the, I'll zoom out and, and we'll get the three together so we can see them all three together. So there's the best. And then let me reach for the better and let me reach for the, for the good. <laughs> so there's that one. And then there's the little baby who is still so incredibly, incredibly beautiful. So we've got the good, the better, and then the best. And it's not just based on size. Remember that. It's based on craft, color of stone, and clarity. So um, there is your kind of 101 to antique amethyst gold brooches. Thank you again for joining me. And again, if this airs on Sunday, which I think it will, happy Easter, springtime blessings to all of you. Thank you so much for everything you do for me. Uh, thanks for sharing me out and thank you for subscribing. I love you so much.